determine whether these impacts were actually related to stress fractures. So we saw it in that one subject. We went um, to a larger group of studies, uh, subjects. And this was a study that we did in collaboration with Dr. Joe Hamill here at the University of Massachusetts. And what we did is we compared the forces between individuals who had a history of stress fractures versus those that, that did not. These are the variables of interest. <clears throat> so we looked at this impact peak of the vert vertical ground reaction force as well as the rate of loading. And that is simply the, the degree of that slope. The higher that, the steeper that slope, the greater the rate of loading. We also looked at tibial shock. Okay, When you land during running, the tibia, the distal tibia usually experiences approximately four to six Gs. Okay, and by the time it gets to your head, it's about one to two because you don't want to shake with adult syndrome, right? So our body is a big filter, and the lower extremity actually takes the brunt of it. This individual you can see had really high tibial shock, uh, about nine Gs. So what we um, found in looking at these individuals who had a history of stress fractures is that they indeed had higher impact peaks, higher load rates, higher tibial shock. Um, and what was really interesting is that the peak vertical ground reaction force, which is actually two to three times what the impact peak is, was not different. And in all of our subsequent studies, the peak force, which is the highest force the body experiences, has never differentiated those who've been injured and those who have not, whether retrospectively or prospectively in our studies. So um, it really appears that it's this impact. It's what's happening early in stance. This is one of the differences, again, between the rear foot and the forefoot strikers. So at this point, now that we've established that it seems that this impact is related to, to um, stress fractures, I put back my PT hat on and I say, you know what? How do we change that? You know, I've treated many people with stress fractures and I've done all the standard interventions. You do strengthening, you do stretching gradually bring back to running. But if those underlying mechanics have not been altered, guess what? Their risk hasn't been reduced. And there's a very high uh, rate of occurrence in this population. So this is really what got us started in this area of gait retraining. <clears throat> so basically what we do in this particular, and we've got a number of lines of retraining research. In this particular line, subjects run on a, on a treadmill and they have a very lightweight, it's about three grams, um, accelerometer that is uh, attached to the distal tibia. And then we display in real time their tibial shock with each foot strike. Let me just show you what it looks like. So this is uh, um, their pre-training uh, uh, tibial shock. It almost looks like an EKG. Each one of those peaks is associated with a foot strike. This is what happens immediately. We can get this kind of reduction right away by giving them that feedback and telling them to, quote, land softer. They can do it immediately. But that's not really going to help us if it doesn't translate into something that they can do out in the field, right? They're not going to have a monitor in front of them when they're running. So we went to the literature, we looked at how skill and motor skill is developed and acquired. And, and what we found is that it's very important for you to, when you provide feedback, that you remove it in a systematic fashion such that they're able to then develop <coughs> internal cues to be able to, to uh, continue with that motor skill. So what we do, and this has been probably over three to five years, we've tried different protocols. We've gotten it down now to eight sessions. So we bring people in for eight sessions. We start them at 15 minutes of running. and we, <coughs> to 30, we increase it to 30 minutes over eight sessions. During the first four sessions, we give them this feedback 100% of the time. But during the last four sessions, we systematically remove this feedback such that at the end, they're... Um, they're running 30 minutes with three minutes of feedback, okay? Now, we test these individuals pre, following the, the retraining, and we have this grant that we're, we're working on now, we're at six and 12 month follow-ups. And this is what it sounds like. I want you to see if you can hear the difference between hard and soft landings. <laughs> You know, the river, you can hear those pounders. It's, it's really quite clear. And you can tell when they've reduced that loading. If you can hear those kind of, uh, I might. okay, sorry. If you can hear that, then I, clearly those impacts are going to be high. So here are some results of our retraining 
Um, this is a single individual who was at 9 G's pre. Uh, the blue is post, and this is just a one month follow-up. The green is one month follow-up. And you can see that they clearly are maintaining that reduced loading as well as the patterns, very similar. Overall, in our subjects, we've been able to reduce tibial shock by 30%. And changes have persisted out to a year. Now, we're not completely done with our one-year follow-ups, and it does appear that there's a little bit of a drift at one year, so we may have to sort of fine-tune our, our protocol. Ground reaction forces, and I think these are probably the more important variables in terms of um, bony loads and strains. You can see the red is pre, the blue is post. They still have an impact peak, because some of these individuals still continue to land on their heels, but you can see clearly that the impact peak has been reduced, as well as the slope of the, um, the uh, rise to this impact peak has been reduced. So impact peaks and load rates were reduced. Um, remember, this feedback, they weren't given feedback on these ground reaction forces, but they were reduced by 16 to 22%. And again, these changes have persisted out to a year thus far. Now, I often get asked, well, how do they do this? How do people change their, their loading? We don't tell them how to do that. We allow them to choose the strategies they want as long as they aren't strategies that look like real extreme maladaptations. Foot strike pattern is one way that they do it. So this is the vertical ground reaction force I've shown you before that has a very clear impact peak with a rear foot strike. A four foot strike pattern, as you can see, has a, a eliminated impact peak and the load rates are significantly less. It's interesting, the midfoot strikers tend to fall somewhere in between. Sometimes they look a little more like a rear foot striker and sometimes they look a little bit more like a forefoot striker. But clearly, they have reduced impact peaks and reduced, reduced load rates. So my thinking at this time was, maybe this is a very nice sort of compromise. Heel strikers have impact peaks and load rates that might be damaging to bone. Forefoot strikers have a lot of load on their Achilles and all of the loads distributed under the forefoot because they tend not to bring their heel down. Midfoot strikers are landing flat, reduce the impacts, and the force gets distributed now across the entire surface of the foot, so lower stress because of larger area that the force is distributed on. So maybe it's a healthy compromise. Well, let's take a look at what happens barefoot. And for those of you who have seen uh, Red uh, Born to Run, these are actually Chris McDougall's feet. And this is what happens, and I can tell you that I brought put many people who've never barefoot run on a treadmill, and this is pretty much what happens pretty soon, after uh, just a couple of minutes. You can see that they're not really landing flat, they're really landing with a forefoot strike pattern. Do you see that? The foot kind of comes in, it hovers like an airplane, and then lands with the heel just slightly up. So that actually is very close to a midfoot strike pattern. If you look at, this is actually our 3D <coughs> model, and you can see that as, this, as he runs, the impact peak is significantly reduced. Do you see that on the right? <clears throat> so no impact peak. Now, one of the questions I had was, okay, well, if you have individuals who've been shoe wearers all their lives and you take their shoes off and have them run, is that really how we were meant to run? Have, that, have wearing those shoes influenced their mechanics? So we recently published a paper in Nature <coughs> looking at the mechanics of individuals who've never, ever put shoes on. They're, these are, are people in poor communities. This is in Kenya. Um, and I'm going to show you a videotape of uh, a Kenyan running out in the field, okay? So that kind of looks like a midfoot strike, right? But if you actually look at this, if you can see that for those of you, you can see that that heel is slightly up. It actually looks very much like Chris McDougall's foot strike, right? So it's, it's as if we just automatically revert back to kind of what's natural the minute that we take our shoes off. So this is something that I have been hotly debated about, both in my own scientific arena, biomechanics, as well as clinical, as well as lay people. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this out there. Maybe we were not designed to land on our heels and experience these impacts that we have found in our, re our previous research related to injuries. Now, there's been a lot of um, suggestion. Riders should go to third world countries, and clearly this is anecdotal, and I co totally admit this. But they tend to report that people who don't wear shoes aren't plagued with a lot of the problems that we have um, as a shot uh, society. So they don't have bunions, they don't have plantar fasciitis, they don't have a lot of those kinds of, of uh, 
injury. So my question is, why were why was footgear uh, developed? If you look at the history of shoes, the earliest example were found under a layer of volcanic rock, and they look very much like the shoes that the Tamahumata wear uh, even today, the Harachi sandals uh, in the Copper Canyons of Mexico. Um, they actually use discarded tires, because it's got a little tread, and they fashioned some leather straps on top of them. So smooth surface held on by straps. So the prime function, and this is where I think we need to get back to, of our early sandals was simply to protect our soul. Not to support it, not to cushion it, and in fact most of the clothing that we wear, short of bras, ladies, um, uh, maybe jock straps, but most of them are to protect us, right? And to protect us from the cold, to protect us from the sun. If we look at the history of running shoes, 1890s, J.D. Uh, Foster and Sons now really <coughs> introduced the first running shoe. How many people had a pair of Keds when they were kids? Yeah. My favorite shoes, okay, 1970, the vulcanized rubber led to the Keds. 1925, Adi Dassler, uh, now Adidas, introduces the customized shoes. Fast forward to 63, we have the Tiger that's imported by Phil Knight. And this is the shoe that introduced the cushion heel. Um, 1972, Phil Knight leaves A6 and he forms Nike. And then Nike makes their own form of this version of this Tiger called the Cortez. How many people remember that shoe? Okay. Now, nearly 40 years later, the modern running shoe, elevated cushioned heel, stiff midsole, stiff heel counter, arch support, high medial midsole density. And in fact, there is now a, a hormonal shoe for you ladies. And I swear, I took this off of their website. This it adjusts its stiffness to your time of the month. <laughs> so what have we come to? I mean, honestly, what have we come to in terms of now, I believe that shoes, the reason that we have a heel strike is because shoes have encouraged this, this heel strike pattern. It makes it comfortable. How many people have tried barefoot running? Okay, how many people have landed on their heel barefoot running? And how comfortable was that? Sucks. Sucks. <laughs> to me, that is the proof. I don't need any scientific proof. I don't need my half a million dollar motion analysis lab or anything like that. Basically, if it hurts to do it, then we probably weren't meant to do it, right? I, I, it's, it's perfect, makes perfect sense. However, 75% of runners land on their heel because the cushioning makes it comfortable. Now you might say, well, that's a good thing, except now we know, and 100% of barefoot runners, once they get running, will not land on their heel. They'll be midfoot or forefoot strikers, and they'll take a shorter stride. Now, the longer stride, let me just say, does afford you a greater speed for a given cadence, but you pay for it, folks. I'm here to tell you, you're getting this impact peak. And this impact peak, as I've said, is related to a number of injuries. Now, barefooters <coughs> actually have a shorter stride. Now they eliminate that impact peak. They have a shorter stride. So one of the questions that I get asked is, okay, I mean, so they have a, if you go barefoot and you have a shorter stride, you've got more turnover, right? More turnover means that you're going to be hitting the ground more often, and maybe that's really going to put you at greater risk. Well, this was a study. It was a modeling study done by some of my um, colleagues in, at the University of Iowa. And what they did is they modeled the tibia, and they looked at how many cycles to failure you get before you actually have a stress fracture, taking a standard stride length versus a 10% shortened stride length. And what they found, basically, was that... Uh, what they found is that when you take the shorter stride lengths, even though it's more strides, you have many, many more cycles before the bone fails. So what this tells you is that number of cycles trumps longer strides and having shorter, shorter, strides, shorter stride lengths. Okay, so then you can say, well, you know what? Shoes prevent pronation, right? How many people have excess, think they have excessive pronation? Okay, and we've been told shoes prevent pronation. Well, let me just... Let's take a look here. This is the subtalar joint axis. This is the, the joint about which the foot pronates and supinates. And this is a vertical ground reaction force that tends to um, strike the ground on the lateral border of the foot, whether you're a rear or a forefoot striker. And we're just going to bring out your physics for those of you who maybe haven't thought about this in a while. This is the moment arm. This is the perpendicular distance from the line of, of action of the muscle. This force times the moment arm gives you the tendency to pronate. Now, let's put a shoe on. And we've got the subtalar joint axis. Now that ground reaction force has got a longer moment arm because you've got this, this heel. Um, and that increases the tendency to pronate. Now, 
you do have to then take the shoe and add different components to the shoe. You add higher density medial midsoles and stiffer heel counters and all kinds of bells and whistles to try to prevent that. The medial lateral ground reaction force also has a larger <coughs> moment arm than if you were barefoot in the shoe. So actually, you have a greater tendency to pronate when you're in shoes. These are the shoes of Ron Hill, who won the 1970 Boston Marathon, who was interviewed by uh, Ambie Burfitt in Runners World this year. And he's really puzzled by how built up these shoes